So this was a really fun conversation with the guys who run the Trigonometry channel, mostly about the complexities of free speech and also the ethics and responsibilities of creators. I think the, the number one thing for us is it comes down to, is this person authentic? Does this person have integrity? Does this person believe in what they're saying? Because we all know people who don't believe in what they're saying, they've got a trick. And when you talk to them and you scratch under the surface, you realize that that's all there is. The, the thing as well is, you know, in terms of what Francis is saying, we've made mistakes in the past. Yeah. We've had people on where we thought this person is acting, you know, in good faith and actually, you get them on and you sort of go. It smells. You just know. So they invited me to challenge them. And at times it did get a little bit heated. I don't see how it's our responsibility to make that happen. But let me make the broader point. But you did the interview out with him. Yes. So I think there is some incentive on you to try and assess the reality. of. You put out a, a, a video that got nearly a million views yeah. saying something you don't know if, if it's true, but it's got an impact, impact on public health. It may have an impact on, on mm. people dying. Like, I do think that there is a certain responsibility on any of us to, to then interrogate the truth of that claim. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a very, very good question. The reality is, is that when we released it, I, we got pushed back, I got pushed back from my friends. And fair play to them. They put their money where their mouth is and walk the talk on free speech. Mm. We went on the Rebel Wisdom show and hopefully that interview will be coming out soon. Uh, David from Rebel Wisdom, we told him uh, we are up for being challenged and having difficult questions asked. And he grilled us, didn't he? Yeah, he didn't fuck about. He didn't fuck about. We had to, you know, argue our case and I really enjoyed it. It was, it was, it, it was great. I, I would go as far as to say we destroyed them with facts and logic. Absolutely. And then he started crying. <laughs> I hope you enjoy the film. So, I'm joined by Constantin and Francis of Trigonometry. Welcome. Thanks Hello. for having us. So, you run a free speech podcast. You have interviewed a lot of the same people that we've interviewed. You've had people like Brett Weinstein on there before, Aisha Akambi. Um, and it's framed as a free speech podcast, which is something I think about a lot. I know you guys think about a lot. We've talked a little bit offline already. And what I feel is that people often have a very sort of binary understanding about it. Like they kind of think about it as like censorship or no censorship. And as people who run relatively popular stations, I know that we kind of think about it like how, who do you invite on? How do you have the conversation? What are the perspectives that are being included? What are the perspectives that are not being included by the mainstream? Like these are really interesting questions for me. I'm gonna start by saying, Something that I'm struck by is that you guys are comedians. Mm. Um, some of the other people who've done very well in this alternative media environment, thinking of Joe Rogan, thinking of Dave Rubin, are also comedians. Do you think that there's any reason uh, why comedians seem to be being successful in this? Well, let me maybe talk about comedians and then Francis can explain <laughs> the show. I think for comedians, the reason is that comedy went at its best is about the pursuit of truth. Right. The jokes that land the hardest are jokes that correspond to some kind of universal human thing that we all know is true, but are afraid to say. And so I think for a lot of comedians, that desire to pursue truth in a world where, as you say, the mainstream increasingly cease to do that is what will encourage people to, to look at that. Uh, so I think it's probably where that comes from. Uh, and, you know, probably to some extent, trigonometry is partly that. Trigonometry is partly that. Trigonometry is also... It, like a lot of these things, it all came out of Brexit and Trump, whereby if we just focus on the Brexit issue, when Brexit happened, there was a narrative that was widely regurgitated that this was because of stupid, thick, racist white people voting against their own self-interest and bigots and all the rest of it. And when you look at it, it was 52% of the population that voted for it. It struck me that something was not quite right with this. My father is voted Brexit. My father also married a woman of colour in the 1970s from Latin America. She was a first generation immigrant. So I knew there was something else going on. And for Constantin and I, it was a search to actually find out what created this movement, what means that people voted for it and why is it that more and more people were being dissatisfied with the mainstream media that they were being presented and mainstream narratives and it kind of all stemmed from there really and for me as well i mean the brexit issue and francis and i both voted remain by the way because we're good people exactly <laughs> uh, that's the running gag on the show uh, but but the you know for me as an immigrant i came here in 1995 i've got dark skin I, i've been called a packy god knows how many times in my life in i've apologized for that you have <laughs> but but you know having said all that 
I've lived in this country for a very long time and I had no idea why Brexit happened. But when people started telling me that's because half of the people of this country are bigoted racists, that's when I went, no, 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 that isn't true. I've lived here long enough. I know what racism looks like. I know what racism looks like in Russia, in Ukraine, in other parts of the Soviet Union, in, in France, in Germany. I've been to all these places. I know what that's like. So for you to tell me half of the British public are racist, that's not true. I know that's not true. So let's find out what's going on. And so we talked to a lot of people, you know, from all the way from Paul Embry, a, a trade unionist socialist uh, who, who voted leave to people on the right who voted leave to try and understand what was going on to academics like Matthew Goodwin to, you know, to get a sense of what was it that was causing people to make those decisions. And through that process, you kind of open your mind to going, well, the mainstream media, you know, didn't cover this well, what else is there? And I remember, you know, that process of disillusionment, which, which I think you cover in your work as well. And, you know, the, the, I'm sure we'll get into this. There's another side to that, which is, do you go, how far do you go down that line? Uh, and I think that's always a danger too. Uh, but 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 the show did start from that place of like something cataclysmic is happening in the world and I have no idea what that is. And it's also being aware that the people that you surround yourself with is not the world. So we were in, you know, working in the comedy industry, which is very hyper liberal. You know, everybody, the vast majority of people purport to be Remain supporters, Labour supporters, all the rest of it. And then going, but then why is the rest of the country not sharing these ideals. If these ideals are correct, honest, true, and moral, why is everybody else not buying in? There's got to be something else going on here that we're not discussing about. And then from there on, we went on our journey. And in, in this interview, I mean, we, we both, um, we all kind of really value free speech. And I want to be, I want to sort of put some of the questions to you. You kind of invited me to challenge you. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, Ask challenge. No, no, absolutely. Um, so I want to say that because I'm going to agree with you for the first part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, I was going to come back to a little bit to the, the free speech question. Um, so what do you see as your responsibility as curators? Because, for example, Joe Rogan is a, is a great is a is a really good case study because he started as a comedian and an MMA uh, commentator who just started doing conversations with people that he found interesting, and suddenly, ten years on, however long it is he's got one of the biggest platforms in the country. And with that, I think you've seen a kind of evolution of like the responsibility or the sense of actually, I'm having to take on decisions that I never intended. Mm -hmm. um, you come from a sort of similar co comedy background. What do you see as your responsibilities as curators? What informs your decisions of like who you have on and how you conduct the interviews? It's a really interesting question, isn't it, David? Because I think this issue of what happens as things grow and get bigger mm -hmm is actually probably the fundamental issue of our time. All the big tech stuff that we talk about and that we care passionately about is really, you know, these teenagers basically, they started companies and then 10 years, 15 years later, suddenly they're in control of the world and they're still wearing a hoodie and they don't know what the hell to do with all this stuff, right? Which is what we want. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, it's kind of a, a not dissimilar process in that, you know, two comedians trying to educate ourselves. I always say trigonometry comes from ignorance and continues down mm. that path, right? We don't know what's going on. We're trying to work it out. So it, there's no science to it. Uh, and that's a problem to some extent. I, I totally recognize that, that, you know, we don't have the journalistic training that you might have in terms of guest selection. And the other problem is, and it is unfortunate, that there is a thing, and this is a thing that exists mainly uh, on the left, we haven't really found it on the right in anything like the same way where if you have, if we had, we just had Dave Badil on the show, for example, a progressive Jewish guy who's written a book about how progressives need to engage in better identity politics to include Jews, basically. It's not a view that I, as a fellow Jew, share particularly, but we've had him on the show, right? No one on the right is going to say, oh, you've had Dave Badil on, I'm not coming on your show, right? But if we have uh, you know, Toby Young on, let's say, who, who's the, the founder of the Free Speech Union, right-wing journalist, is very controversial to many people's eyes. There'll be a lot of people on the left who will never come on your show after that or on our show after that. So that in trying to speak to different voices, which we feel really passionate about, uh, we do come up against that part of it, which is there's a sort of like contagion thing that happens on the left, which makes it more difficult. But for us, you know, we've 
we've, we always want to talk to people from different sides uh, because we're still trying to educate ourselves. We don't know everything about everything. We hardly know anything about anything. And, and so uh, the responsibility is too big a word for us. We literally just trying to fill our brains with stuff that's useful to us at this point. Sure, but you, you, all, you have framed your show. It's called Trigonometry. Yeah. You've kind mm -hmm. of framed it in a certain way that yeah. seems to be and let's say anti-woke or like th that there's part of that as well. But, but the thing with the, with Do you the name. you regret the name at all? Uh, sometimes, but the, re the, the reason that we regret the name is mo mostly because in my opinion, people misunderstand what the name is about. When we called it trigonometry, we were not intending to position ourselves in the sort of Donald Trump Jr. wrote a book called Triggered Space, right? What we were trying to say is we are going to explore issues that will be offensive to some people. And so if you're coming to watch this podcast or this YouTube show and you see controversial issues being discussed, that's because that's the point of the show. So if you are someone who's easily triggered or easily offended, this may not be the show for you. That's the intention. The intention has never been to attract people who just you know own the libs. Mm. That's never been what we're about. And so to that extent, I do every now and again sort of go, it would be better if our show had been called, you know, Honest Conversations or something like that. I, I do feel that way. But um, and by the way, the show actually triggers people from all sides, that's true. you know, and yeah. there's some people who get very, very upset with it. You know, like we had Lord Andrew Adonis on, an ardent Remainer, mm. and we did a live show with him at the Battle of Ideas in the Barbican. And we do what we normally do. We allow our guests time and space to speak. And he put forward his idea about why he thought Brexit was going to be a disaster, why we need to cancel, you know, the referent the vote and all the, all the rest of it. And afterwards, I got confronted by somebody who's a fan. He's like, I've been a long term fan of yours. And, you know, I'm very upset. You just didn't challenge him. You didn't challenge him. This is what people you say. When, when, what, basically, the way it works is when you talk to someone people like. Yeah. And you let them talk. People are, I love the way you don't interrupt your guests. You're not Kathy Newmaning this thing. The moment you talk to someone they don't like, it's like, why didn't you challenge them more? Right. And that will always be the case. But for us, we are very, very careful. We love our fans. We respect our audience, but we will never pander to them. We want to talk to the people that we find interesting. And it's a good comparison you make with comedy in that you have to be aware that you have an audience but you can't slavishly think to yourself, what do they want? How can I please them? Because the moment you do that, you've lost the game. You sell out. You sell out. But do you feel that, do you feel that kind of gravitational force? And are you worried about that? No, no, I, I don't really feel it. To be honest, this is, this is where you say comedy training has been very helpful. The best comedians are comedians who could not care less about the audience. It's a paradox mm. because y your job is to make them feel good and laugh. Mm. But the very best comics are the ones where you get that sense. They don't care. They don't care if you laugh. They've got their own thing that they want to say. And I'm, by the way, not saying either of us are great comedians, but the training is helpful, right? Mm -hmm. Being on stage, dying, uh, you know, not getting the reaction you want. I don't know what that's like. <laughs> 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 um, but, but it teaches you to not care because actually you go on stage, you tell a joke, no one laughs, you walk off stage, no one died, yeah. actually. We, we, comedians call a bad night dying but actually nothing happened you know no one walked away from that going oh i can't believe that no one cares yeah. you know and so i feel actually the benefit of getting to the audience size that we now have is with the greatest respect to them i don't really have to think too carefully about what people think because i know that your audience finds you right and this is the thing that francis and i have always actually been really careful about is just being ourselves and trusting that our instincts are the real liberal, right? Uh, in the sense that we believe in freedom, um, freedom of conversation, freedom of discussion. And if there's people on the right who don't like having us having a conversation with someone on the left, that's not our problem. That's not our problem. And if, if that means that we lose a chunk of our audience, we've done that several times mm -hmm. where we've deliberately gone out of our way to distance ourselves from people or to get a guest on who puts a counterpoint because that's the show. Which example? So example would be the Capitol riots. Uh, you know, um, the chunk of our audience that would be pro-Trump didn't like our take on it because our take on it was this is completely wrong. Uh, this is an attempt to subvert democracy. I don't think it was well orchestrated or well organized, mm -hmm. but what it definitely was, was people 
storming a, a building that is designed for decision making in order to prevent a decision being endorsed, right? That's a big problem. Pretending that's not a problem is absolutely ridiculous. I don't care how much you like Trump. The, if, if the left did that, you'd go batshit, yeah. right? Yeah, I had a similar experience. I put out a piece trying to balance, trying to say, yeah, the mainstream media really underplayed the Antifa riots in the summer. Yeah. The sort of like mostly peaceful meme that was going around with CNN, for example. And I, I deliberately tried to kind of frame it in terms of like, you can hold these two things at the same time. 100%. The fact that what happened on January the 6th was, was reprehensible, I use that word advisedly, does not mean that you're then validating the, the, the way that the mainstream media was treating kind of the, the riots in the summer or whatever. And you still got in the comments like loads of people going, oh, you're letting Antifa off the hook. It's like, what do you mean I'm letting Antifa yeah. off the hook? This is, I'm responding to the thing that's just happened now. Yeah. This is, it, it was but bizarre. that's fine. But that's it fine, all man. goes down again to that word integrity, which is having integrity, integrity of values and your beliefs. So we had Brett Weinstein on, who's of course, Brett would describe himself as being on the left, but we also had Douglas Murray on, who was fiercely critical of Trump and quite rightly so. And I, I think it's fair to say to, that Douglas is a darling of people on the conservative and, and right. And the, the, the anger of some of the comments saying, oh, you've abandoned us or whatever else. But he hasn't. He's having, he has integrity. Yeah. And he is calling something out which is unforgivable. You cannot, you simply can't do that. And maybe coming back to your question about responsibility, that may have been a moment where actually we did feel a bit of a sense of like, we need to be responsible here and we need to bring someone from the left and someone from the right mm. who are going to give direction perhaps to some extent uh, on what a sensible approach this looks like. Because yes, we've, you know, we've had prominent black guests on the show and white guests to talk about the problems with BLM and Antifa, right? How could we possibly not talk about the Capitol riots and be critical? How can you, how can you say, well, you know, being, you know, having your walls green is wrong and then have your walls painted green, yeah. you know, and pretend that's somehow not, you know, that's bullshit. That's not real. That's not, that's not having honest conversations with fascinating people, which is what the slogan of the show is. How do you decide? Where do you draw the line? Are there people that you would never have on? Of Are there course. people that yeah. you're being pushed to have on that you're, you're like, no, I'm not going to go 100%. there? 100%. Yeah. I think the, the number one thing for us is it comes down to, is this person authentic? Does this person have integrity? Does this person believe in what they're saying? Because we all know people who don't believe in what they're saying. They've got a trick. And when you talk to them and you scratch under the surface, you realize that that's all there is. And ultimately, it's not going to make for a very good interview. The, the thing as well is, you know, in terms of Francis saying, we've made mistakes in the past. Yeah. We've had people on where we thought this person is acting, you know, in good faith. And actually, you get them on and you sort of go... It smells. Mm. You just know. You just yeah. know. It's yeah. not even an intellectual thing. It's, and have you put those interviews out? Some, some, yeah. some, yes, some, no. Yeah. Some you sort of realize after the fact as yeah. well. That's a problem. Do you name names? No. 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 But there, there are some that you put out and you go, it felt okay, but there's something off. Yeah. We've and, had one or two of those too. And then a couple of months down the line, you see the mask slip and you think, yeah. 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 So that, that, that's a pitfall, but it's yeah. a pitfall. You know, for, you know, for there's everybody. There's pitfalls and everything, isn't there? And who would you not have on? Would you... Loads of people. Yeah. Alex Jones? No. God, no. No, no we God, wouldn't have no. Alex Jones on in, in, in any shape or form. Um, Maybe it's who good to explain why. Who do most pressure to have on that who, you wouldn't who have do we on? Get, who, do, who do we get most pressure to have on? I'd say... Well, it's a combination, mm -hmm. isn't it? it yeah. would, I'd say it's Owen Jones and Tommy Robinson. Robinson. Yeah. Which would make a hell of a podcast, those two. Those two together, yeah. 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 So those are the two. And actually... And I, what I, reason would you give for not having either of those? No, I, I very much want Owen on. Yeah. I, I would be delighted yeah. to have Owen on. I mean, he's blocked me on Twitter, <laughs> but I would... Uh, yeah. But, no, we'd love to have Owen on. Yeah. Uh, and I know Tommy Robinson is a kind of hero of, of a lot of people, certainly on YouTube, yeah. a lot of people. Why would you not have him on? Well, my, my thing with Tommy Robinson... Look, it's a complicated subject for a number of reasons which we can get into. Um, the reason I think a lot of people think that Tommy Robinson is a hero on YouTube is that Tommy Robinson, and I don't know the tr whether this is true or not, right? But the, the, the perception is that he was the first person to have raised the grooming gangs issue. And we've had a survivor of a grooming gang on our show to talk about it. And we thought that was the way 
the, that issue ought to be addressed mm. through that medium, right? Talking to someone who's experienced it, who's campaigned about it, who's advising government on it. That is, in my view, the responsible approach. But a lot of people feel that Tommy Robinson was the person who spearheaded the awareness of that issue. And, and if that is true, I do think that's significant. The grooming gang story is massively underreported, undercovered, and it's a fucking tragedy what happened. It's an absolutely disgusting tragedy. And the fact that thousands of young women were raped by dozens of men and people were afraid to stop that because they thought they'd be called racist, it's despicable, right? But the, the problem with someone like Tommy Robinson is that he's just someone who keeps being in violent. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, we don't want people on the show who, who keep beating people up in the street mm -hmm. and people love to defend them and go it's self-defense. Well, there's not. There's videos of him walking up to someone and punching them in the back of the head. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So the violence thing is a big, big, big yeah. no, no. And there's also the question with some of these people like, do you have the knowledge, like some people that people request to have on? It's like it's a controversial person. Do I feel that I have the knowledge or the, the background to be able to actually hold them to account. Because exactly. yeah. I do think I do think that some interviews it's fine to just kind of let people talk, but yeah. other interviews it's like, no, you, you actually need to dig a little bit. 100%. You need to challenge and you need to put some of their previous uh, statements to them. And that can become performative. Like yeah. a lot of the time, the, the problems with the mainstream is that it becomes a performative. The journalist is just signaling with their questions, I don't, I don't like you very much. Yeah. And other journalists are watching this, therefore I need to signal how much I hate you. Mm. There's an interesting one with Steve Bannon a while ago, I think. Uh, it might have been at da The Economist, I think, did one with Steve Bannon. All the questions are basically, I don't agree with you, I don't agree with you, I don't agree with you. So it can become performative, which is why I think a lot of people have lost their faith in the mainstream media. But that has a place as yes, well. Agreed. And that's another thing I'm worried about in the alternative media is this sense of we're in between worlds where one is collapsing, the other one, there's no real rules for it. And so I think we're losing a lot of these journalistic like the necessary tools for pursuing truth, because you've got these whole ecosystems where people don't want to see a, a challenging interview. Mm -hmm. Like these people can get kind of infinite amounts of views going on friendly podcasts where they're never going to get challenged. And this system seems to be breaking down because free speech only works as a, as a method of pursuing truth when you go in, when you actually use it to pursue truth, when ideas battle against each other. And if all we're getting is these kind of ecosystems where they're not meeting, mm -hmm. That's a real concern. Mm. Um, and I guess, yeah, do you have anything to well, reflect well, on that? Well, one of the things, are, the challenges that we face is when, and we've talked about this, is when you interview scientists, especially constants from an economics background, I'm from an arts background, we don't really know what they're talking about. So when you platform someone like that, they could be talking, they could be sounding very you know, brilliant, quoting this, quoting that, but we don't have a background to challenge them on, which means that we can be quite selective when picking from people from that background because the reality is you don't know what they're saying and we don't necessarily have the expertise to be able to push back on them. So with certain things when it comes to lockdown you can do your research, you can look into it, you can read about it, you've got personal experience, you know things. But with other things, maybe biology or whatever else, we're, com you know, we're complete laymen. Yeah, I think the, probably the best example of uh, things we're trying to stay away from is actually, and this speaks to your point about the, the interrogative style of journalism having a place. And I completely agree with that. Uh, we don't almost never, we've made one or two exceptions for people where we felt it was appropriate. We, we almost never have serving politicians on. Mm. And that's because our it's style boring, of- It's boring, no? It's not just that it's boring, it's because our style of interview is not appropriate for yeah. that sort of thing. Um, the, you know, they've been media trained out of their brains. They've, they, they've, they're coming, they're not going to say anything that they actually think. They've got the party line that they're going to regurgitate. And our interview, which is where we basically listen to you attentively and try and, you know, help you get your story out, right, as best you can. Uh, I don't think it works for, for a politician. So uh, an Andrew Neil style of interview I think is much more appropriate for that and it has a place as you say yes. but equally as you say the mainstream have gone too far in that direction where every interview with everyone becomes like that the other point I just wanted to add in terms of echo chambers I go on you know I've been on Good Morning Britain five times I go on BBC and they usually bring me on as the sort of evil voice of the whatever 
And I'm quite happy. I love having my ideas challenged. You know, that's why before we started this interview, I said to you, ask us anything, be as aggressive as you want, challenge us. I love that. I, I, because even if you, if you in the course of this interview show me that I'm wrong about something, I'll walk away and thank you for it because I want to learn. You know, I want to understand and by no means do I know everything. But it's also as well that having your ideas challenged with the vast majority of people is actually deeply unpleasant because mm -hmm. it's conflict. And then automatically when there's conflict, there's discomfort. And people, the vast majority of people will do anything to avoid discomfort, which is why you're getting this growing polarization, even with the podcast. Yeah. Like we had like David Baddiel on and there were moments of it where the not fractious, but, you know, there was a difference. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, there was a tension. And as a result of that, it becomes uncomfortable. It was Jew on Jew violence. <laughs> but, the worst kind. <laughs> <laughs> very, it is. Very, the, very poorly coordinated. Yeah, for the spectator, it is definitely the worst kind. But, <laughs> but I think that is the, the issue. And that is why, with certain exceptions, I think more and more you're going to see this kind of parting of the waves with podcasts and shows. And you're also going to see it, I think, in the mainstream. I want to come back to something that you said before, Francis, about especially the science questions being something that you kind of struggle to, yeah. um, to feel that you have enough. And this is the, probably the strongest criticism or the strongest question that I'll put to you guys. Because, yeah. um, and, and this is something that I've seen and has worried me a, ma a, a lot since the beginning of COVID. Mm. Like, I know you've been aware of the London Real situation mm. as yes. well. Like what I saw happening early on, like London Real had on David Icke, basically, pretty much saying COVID was a hoax, it was caused by 5G, and coming very close to saying you need to take matters into your own hands, otherwise life yeah. is over. And it's like, that was taken down by YouTube, and I think quite quite rightly. I mean, mm, and I know, I, and I know, because I've sp spoken to people who are behind the scenes at London Real, Brian Rose knew that was likely to happen. Mm. And then off the back of it, kind of launched this kind of scam, digital freedom, grifting platform, mm -hmm. and went fully into kind of anti-vax, COVID denialism, and what I saw, the, the terrifying thing since the beginning of COVID, because everyone's at home, everyone's scared, everyone's terrified, is you've seen this massive incentive structure for disinformation start to build up. Um, you had a little bit of a run-in with, with London Real as well, I think. Is that... Uh... I, do, I don't know that we have, have we? No, we haven't. No. I mean, you mentioned him on the live stream. Or oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Look, we, we, we take the piss out of him all the time because I think the way you covered it in your documentary is exactly right. Mm. Uh, the guy scammed people out of money uh, uh, claiming to build some kind of platform, which he then, as far as I understand, didn't build. And also, uh, you know, while, while I don't think it's always the best approach, sometimes I just look at someone and go, yeah, I don't think you are what you claim to be. It's the also back in... hair and the suit, <laughs> uh, a giveaway. Yeah, I don't have enough hair to do that, but um, <laughs> to do that myself. But so, so yeah, I don't think we've had any personal run-ins, but I, I'm, I wouldn't say we're fans of his work. No. I think that's fair to say. No, and you just look at him and it's basically probably the South London and me. I mean, that is someone who deserves to have the piss taken out of them. <laughs> if he walked, if you met him, you'd be like, nah, you kind of, yeah. For what he for and also it might be just a British and American thing that yeah. Americans tend to take themselves very seriously. Yeah. Whereas for us, that's a bit of a put off. Yeah. Um, so the point I'm coming to is, you did an interview with uh, Sutrip Bhakti. Bhakti. Yeah. And you promoted it with a. I saw that it was the clip that I saw on 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 Twitter where you promoted it with him saying, "I'm not going to take the vaccine. I'm not mad." Mm. Would you take the vaccine? Of course not. I'm not mad. <laughs> <laughs> At the time when, as far as I can tell, like vaccines are pretty much our, our main way out of the situation we've been in, that was the first time I saw something that I thought, oof. The decision to have him on is, is one decision, the decision to have a, an a, a interview with him, but the decision to use that to promote the interview. Mm. In an environment where, and I think that interview got, was heading for like a million views yes. at one point, mm. like... This 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 worries me because I don't feel like I have the ability to judge whether this is a, this is a valid person to have on all of that stuff. Do you in any way regret having him on? There's or? a factual correction that ought to be made there, which is the interview and the clip were both prepared and recorded and like made and scheduled to go out prior to any vaccine being released. Isn't that more dangerous though? Uh, well. This is someone who's the former chair of medical microbiology at the University of Mainz in Germany. So this isn't a random guy off the internet. 
right? Uh, and what he was talking about was the method by which the vaccine was being developed. And he explained in great detail. And we had a lot of people who said, well, actually, I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a nurse. And the way he explained it is correct. Mm -hmm. His argument was that the way that the vaccine was being developed is untested and untried. And for someone like me, who has no pre-existing health conditions and who's otherwise healthy, taking the vaccine is not a risk worth taking. Now, to me, that's a perfectly legitimate argument, mm. right? I don't see any problem with making that argument. Uh, the, you, you as an individual have a responsibility to make up your own mind about taking a vaccine or not. Mm. And the fact that this person who is not a random person has that opinion, I don't think that's insignificant. You know, this conformity of view on COVID that we've had, I think is actually quite dangerous. The idea that the World Health Organization, which has flipped about left and right. Well, sure, and I'd agree with that. I mean, that's, right? not, that's so, not the question. I'm talking about the specific. The yeah. specific thing. Well, this is someone who said that he personally wouldn't take the vaccine. I don't see what, what the concern with that would be. Well, because, OK, for example, I mean, he's someone who has a medical background. Mm -hmm. He was denounced by his university, effectively. The university put out a statement saying he doesn't represent us. He's got nothing sure. to do with yeah. us. And there are a lot of people who would be critical of what he would say. Mm. Like my my point is like I, I think these I think these issues need to be discussed. Yeah. yeah. I think the criticisms of the WHO, I think the kind of lockdown skepticism, like all of that stuff I think needs to have a, a, a perspective. And it's been um, I think Unheard put out a really good set of articles mm. about this. Like it's been suppressed. A lot of this stuff has been suppressed. And Unheard have had a bunch of videos yeah. taken down and then reinstated sure. as well. Right. And I and I and I agree with them, but what I like something like that about such an important topic especially when the incentive structure like there's a huge desire for people to say these sort of things that i think starts to warp the possibility like warp our decisions of who to get on like it's not necessarily that this guy's right that gets him a million views it's because he's one of the few people saying it so i do wonder whether there's a more responsible way a more kind of truthful way of doing that like could you get someone on who would disagree with it well so here's the thing right yeah. uh to contextualize this further the first person we ever had to, on about COVID was the moment COVID happened. Mm -hmm. And it was a guy from Southampton University called Dr. Michael Head, who had a very conventional view. Mm -hmm. And he put that forward and we gave him the opportunity to talk about it. That was the first person we ever had on. So we gave people that viewpoint. And I also think it was important to have someone on from the lockdown skeptical camp mm -hmm. to counterbalance that. So uh, I think that context is relevant here, which is, mm -hmm. You've got both, right? Um, I think it will, it will never now feel this way, but you've got to remember at the time, the vaccine didn't exist. So now it looks like the way out. Back then, what people were actually saying is we might not have a vaccine for years. That's, that was the conversation at the time that interview was recorded. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I really don't have any regrets about having him on. And I also would say, we didn't actually think when we recorded that interview that it would get more than 20 or 30,000 views. So it wasn't a decision we made based on, oh, if we get this guy on to say all this wacky shit, we can get loads of views. Sure, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying I know you aren't saying that, but yeah. I think it's important for me yeah. to articulate that. But if that. you were to, f to subsequently realize or um, find out that you, he was not uh, respectable or that you thought he was, he was not correct in what he was saying, mm. Would that change your decision of having him? Well, what I would tell you is when YouTube took that video down, we didn't appeal. Yeah. Mm. And why not? Uh, because, first of all, under YouTube's rules, it was quite clear that the way they now implemented the rules, mm. that appeal wouldn't be successful, number one. The other thing is, as the vaccine started to be developed, we, we, we started to feel like we weren't certain that what he was saying was correct. Um, and so to fight over something like that, we didn't feel was worth it. Mm. Uh, but I, I, my view is it was the right decision to have him, to have him on at the time. Mm. You can only make the decision at the time. Yeah. At the time, I thought it was the right decision. Mm. And we had uh, so friends of mine who are doctors or molecular biologists watch it and say, well, everything that he's saying is not incorrect scientifically. Now, he's got his own opinion on it, mm. but... He has a scientific background. He is an expert in that field. He should be allowed to say what he thinks. Mm. It's just the problem is, is we, we live in now, now obviously, with, with the virus, where everything that you put out with, which explores that kind of subject is immediately so charged. Mm. 
mm. and it is imbued with such a level of responsibility that our other interviews aren't. Yeah. And I, what, I mean, my, my, my question is like, how do we do, because this is something I wrestle with as well. There's a question, yeah. the lab leak hypothesis, yeah. Yeah. which is another really interesting topic. Mm. Brett Weinstein talks about that a lot. Yeah. Mm. And if you look at it just objectively, it's very interesting that it came from Wuhan, where they mm. had the BSL mm. Safety 4, la, la, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Like, it's a really interesting topic. And I've been thinking about how do I do that in a kind of a, a way that kind of tries to get at the truth. So I've been trying to get someone from both sides. Mm. Brett has agreed to do it. Mm. I had a conversation with, um, and it's very difficult to find someone to argue the other side because as far as they're concerned, this is not worth talking about. Mm. It's been discredited or it's just science fiction. Yeah. There's this kind of gap between the mainstream narratives and the alternative narratives and it's not being bridged. Mm. So my question is like, you have someone who's effectively anti-vax on, how do we bridge that? Do you have on someone who, who is then kind of responding to what they say? Do you have on someone who's arguing the other the other case, because I don't see, what I see is that these other, these counter mainstream narratives are not being challenged in most, in most environments. Well, that, the, my, that's always been my argument, actually, in terms of uh, Dr. Bakhti, right? Which is, if you are the government and you are concerned about quote unquote anti-vaxxers, mm. your responsibility, my view, is to take that interview that we did mm. and get a prominent expert in that field to come out and break down why this is wrong. And you put that out and inform the public. And I think the so way... You, is it not your responsibility? Well, as I said, we have had a number of guests from across. We had someone who was very pro all of this stuff. We had Dr. Carol Sakura, who's probably somewhere in the middle. And we had this guy on, right? But I think what we actually should do is just for a moment, I, I get your question, I do. We should take a little bit of a step back. Because you don't know if this guy's talking the truth or not. Like they, we've already accepted we're not scientists, we're not medical, Absolutely. we're not virologists. Absolutely. So therefore we're taking a kind of risk or a leap into a faith when we invite someone like that on. But, we're trying to assess their credibility, we're not entirely sure. sure. There's some sources I've said that this guy's basically a crank. Yeah. There's some that say, no, he's kind of, he's, he's a renegade doctor, but he's expressing something true. Yeah. We don't necessarily know. Right. But my point is, we don't know whether Dr. Fauci is telling the truth, mm. right? We don't know whether Chris Whitty is telling the truth. There's, there's videos from March of last year, them saying masks don't work. We don't need masks. We don't need this. We don't need that. Sure. But they are subject to an awful lot more criticism and more scrutiny than most. Mm. Okay. But how, uh, are you saying Dr. Bakhti is not subject to criticism? Yes, that's what I'm saying. I don't agree with that. I think he's been thoroughly criticised in quite a lot of places. And have those views got um, nearly a million views? I don't know, but my point is... This is the, this is the point. I think that the system is broken yes. for assessing the truth yeah. of that yeah. claim or not. And you've just described the way that it's broken, which is the people who one, should one be putting the, the counter-argument, the sure. right? They yes. don't want to do it. Sure. So I don't see how it's our responsibility to make that happen. But let me make the broader point. But you put the interview out with him. Yes. So I think there is some incentive on you to try and assess the reality. If you put out a, a, a video that got nearly a million views yeah. saying something you don't know if, if it's true, but it's got an impact impact on public health. It's got an impact probably on the amount of people taking up the vaccine. It may have an impact on, on mm. people dying. Like I do think that there is a certain responsibility on any of us mm. to, to then interrogate the truth of that claim and maybe put out something that, that we, we put this out, we don't know, we thought he was credible. This is a, a counterpoint. Mm. But I suspect that wouldn't get a million Well, years. we did it the other way around, is what I'm saying. We had someone on to put the pro lockdown position. Sure, but we're initially. talking about vaccine rather than lockdown well, here. The, so again, you, you're picking out something that was not big. It wasn't a big issue at the time because there was no vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something by the time the sure, vaccine... As the situation has changed, do you think the there could been be taken a reason down. now to put out something to say we're, we're investigating his claims and we, this is, this is... Well, as I said, the video is no longer there. So by the time the vaccine had come out, look, my, my memory with dates is not great, but my recollection is by the time the vaccine was properly available, the, the, the video had already been taken down because of the new YouTube rules. And as I said, we didn't appeal it because we were like, well, we're not sure whether it's worth doing that. Uh, but can I just make the broader point? Because I and do if think it was still important. up, <laughs> okay, never if mind. If it was still up, now the vaccines exist, do yeah. you think that you would bring on someone to talk about the vaccines? to counter that, say it had gone to two or three million views mm. by now, like that. Yeah, I think we would. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think yeah. we would. Why not? Well, we'd love to get someone on to explain why a vaccine is great. 
Yeah. And why it's yeah. no danger and why, you know, people's concerns about it. Well, I mean, I'll ask impact. both of you, do you feel, because I would feel some sense of moral obligation yes. in that situation to do that mm. is what I'm, what I'm saying. And I'm wondering if those are things that you wrestle with. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a very, very good question. The reality is, is that when we released it, I, we got pushed back, I got pushed back from my friends. So I went to uh, my partner, who's uh, her best friend is working in a COVID ward in New York City. He watched it. He went, what he's saying is not untrue. I disagree with certain elements of it, but the fundamental science underneath it is consistent and correct. Other people saw it as well. Now, I've spoken to people who, medical professionals, who say that they would not take the vaccine because we don't know the long-term implications of these vaccines. So the difficulty is, do I believe that he has the right to say that? I do. Now, when it comes to the point of responsibility is, and where we are, do I feel that we should actually, and I'm, I'm talking myself through because this is something that I'm really, I've, I've wrestled with. Do I feel that we have an obligation to point, to put the other side to it? I would say, I would say I think we do actually. Yeah, but certainly I don't have any aversion to it. As I say, now that the video is not there, to counterpoint a video that doesn't exist yeah. anymore seems a bit pointless to me. And, and your point is accurate that yeah. it probably, if we were to do that, it might not get as many views, which is why I said the government's job is to inform the public, right? Yeah. And if there are people who are putting a counter narrative, sure. it's not their job to say, oh, this guy's an anti-vaxxer. Yeah. It's their job to explain what he's saying that's incorrect. Sure. But, I, yeah. but let me just make the broader point, because I do think this is important. That my parents are both biochemists. My dad was actually responsible for, well, making viruses and also making vaccines in the mm -hmm. Soviet Union in their chemical and biological weapons program. Both my parents are scientists. And in our house, we had books on all sorts of science. But also, my parents, I remember they had some book by an American guy talking about how uh, doctors are... Uh, the reason that people have diseases. Some, you know, I'm trivializing it, but basically he gave an example in Israel where doctors go and strike for a month and suddenly people stop dying, that sort of thing, right? Now, that book existed, it got published, it got printed around the world, translated into, and I don't recall anyone going, oh my God, this anti-vaxxer, anti-doctor, anti-whatever. People were allowed to express a view and people were allowed to read it and make up their own mind. And I think, infantilizing individual human beings to the point where like I've heard an argument about the vaccine instantly I am now responsible for for that person's decision I think that's that's giving me way too much credit as, sure, as an sure. and I'm not taking that position yeah I mean in general I think what you're seeing especially with the, the, the sort of mainstream criticism is they're trying to do something that can't be done. They're trying to basically put the genie back in the bottle. Mm. Like, and, and part of the issue is like, we're not going to engage with these, uh, with these narratives. We're just going to criticize them. We're just going to paint people as yeah. beyond the pale if they yeah. think this yeah. way. And that's never going to work anymore. Now, you have to engage with them. You have to explain why this doesn't have credibility or, or this doesn't work. And you've got this kind of breakdown of like the gatekeeper mm -hmm. ethos of the mainstream media saying these topics are beyond the pale. These perspectives are beyond the pale. And I think that's why I think we're in a different environment where we do need to interrogate these ideas. And I, and I think the question is, like, how do we do this? Mm. And what I was really pleased with is when you said, Francis, and I, and I saw the process you went through, like, you're, you're wrestling with it. Yeah, we yeah. are. Like the, yeah, fact, we are. the fact that we're wrestling with it, I think, is, is the most important point. Because I would also say it's like, on, in, on your, what's also obvious is that if you guys just put out anti-vax, um, conspiracy stuff or whatever, you would get far more views. Yeah. Like I see, I see in, the, in the choice of guests and the choice of stuff that you're covering, a sense of integrity and a sense of these are the questions, these are the people that I think are credible. And I, I want to kind of say that as well. I don't think, I don't think that you're, you're just following kind of the views and sort of saying, oh, this one's going to get a lot of traction. Because I think there are certain topics, especially around COVID, that you could just keep going and keep going and yeah. keep going and you can kind of rack up like, and we've done actually the opposite. Yeah, we've stopped sure. talking about COVID. 
Yeah, I got, I got that feeling looking at the, yeah. the recent news. Because it's just, uh, first of all, I mean, it, I think everyone just wants it to be over. That's mm. the first part of it. And we want it to be over, and we're not really that interested in it anymore. Uh, that's mainly the, 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 our feeling about it, really. People are, you know, that's the other thing. You know, as much as we think of the show as educational and whatever, we also feel like there's an entertainment part to mm. what we do, particularly with live streams, but also to some extent with the interviews. And the one thing I think people massively underappreciate, particularly in our position where we're fortunate uh, to, 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 to still be able to work, right, to still be able to create stuff, to still have a meaningful existence. Mm. There's a lot of people who are really, really struggling right now. And we feel actually our main responsibility is actually to keep people's spirits up and to keep them sort of entertained. And YouTube privilege. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And we, 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 we feel that very, very strongly. You know, uh, this, it's been such a difficult time for many people. So from our perspective as well, just talking about the same things. Yes, it's going to get views, but we're, we're much more interested in, in having a healthy impact uh, mm -hmm. on the world. Um, and that's why we've we sort of stopped talking about it as much as we did. The lab leak thing is a good example of this. Like, you know, we could obviously, Brett is a friend of ours, we could very happily get him on the show to talk about it. I just don't really think it's that, to me, it's not that important anymore from, from where I sit. There'll be other people for whom that's essential that they go and do that. But from our perspective, in terms of the way we deal with our audience, actually moving on, I think is probably the healthier thing. It's how I feel. However, having said that, one thing we haven't talked about enough is lockdown. The long-term implications of lockdown, the implications of lockdown on our children. There are gonna be studies done on that cohort of children and what, how it's impacted their livelihoods, how it impacted their education, drug addiction rates. I mean, this is just me saying this, but I really think you're going to see a spike amongst that generation of children yeah. because they have had their education stunted as a result and their opportunities. And it's also as well, I mean, the fact that YouTube have now said that you can't discuss something which contravenes WHO guidelines, it's a rare, very real problem. Neil Ferguson said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing the quote, that when he saw what happened in China with lockdowns, he, it made him understand what was possible, what we could do in the UK. And that statement chilled He's my... He's a scientist who'd been advising the UK. Yeah, yeah, say, yeah, yeah. Why, and we, we talk about, oh, these people have been challenged. To my knowledge, no one has ever challenged him on that, the civil liberties aspect of that. No. And you no. think, well... Well, look, 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 give you an example, right? So... Boris Johnson has regular press conferences with his scientific advisors, and he gets journalists and members of the public calling in. I have never, ever heard a single person ask him how many people die from lockdowns. Why? How can you possibly make a decision to lock down the country if you don't know the answer to that question? How? You can't make that, but it's not being interrogated, right? So when we talk about these people are getting all the criticism, like Chris Whitty, I don't, I don't agree with that. Actually, I don't think the right questions are being asked and that's a failure of the media. And, you know, again, we come back to that point. So it's uh, I think you're right. You know, we, we are wrestling. We're all wrestling with this yeah. stuff. Um, and, I, you know, that sort of hoodie billionaire yeah. thing to, to a degree, but also at the same time, Boris did did consult at one point with with some very lockdown skeptic scientists. I think he got in three from the. Was it Sinatra Gupta and a, two, two others? So he has he has kind of toyed with 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 that. So how many people do lockdowns that? kill? How many people do they kill? Boris, if you're watching, <laughs> we don't know the answer no, to that. I don't, yeah. And I think we need to. Sure, sure. And I think all of us, yeah, anyone who's thinking carefully about this is is like it brings up all sorts of questions, like our kind of terror, like death anxiety as a culture, like, mm. are we making this one metric yeah. ahead of absolutely everything else, et cetera, et cetera. All of these questions, I think, do need to be interrogated. The last time there was an estimate, I, there was an article in the Metro which said that lockdowns, the first lockdown is estimated to kill 200,000 people over five years, mm. right? That, that doesn't seem to me like a good trade-off. 75. From what? From mental health issues? Uh, cancer, from, mis misdiagnosis, yeah. yes. mistreatment. Mm. You know, we know, I know people have died because of lockdown. Young and otherwise people who would have lived a long life had they been treated properly, right? Yeah. So that's not a conversation that's being had honestly. And I think this is a part that sort of did get missed a little bit in our conversation earlier. Uh, I completely accept your challenges on the Dr. Bakhti interview. But equally, there's the same thing happening on the pro 
lockdown pro-vaccine thing. There's a lot of concerns. This is the thing, like we keep being told the polls are everyone's pro-vaccine and all that sort of thing. Actually, there's a lot of people who, who are very concerned about its long-term effects and they're concerned because no one has ever explained to them what's wrong with the interview with Dr. Bakhti, right? Yeah. Uh, and as you say, a lot of those people don't want to come and talk about it, you know? So th there's a lot of duplicity going on on both sides. And I think I agree with you. It's, it's a problem for all of us. I do agree with you. Yeah. Um, I'll finish off on the UK, US stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, one of, one of the interesting factors for me is this sense that like cultural war stuff was not that big in the UK mm. until relatively recently. And I think a lot of it has be, been because of the, the big tech platforms, like they're kind of, they've unified a lot of the kind of information space, which means that suddenly we're all Americans. Yeah. We're all kind of subject to these kind of culture war dynamics that I don't think we were subject to in the same way before. Um, what, because I know in our, our audience is probably like 40% America, maybe nearly half North America is yours. Same, probably 40 percent it's around about 40 percent we've yeah. got about 32 percent american seven eight six canadian depending on the month as well yeah yeah, yeah. so it's kind of very similar yeah. um and i'm interested in like the differences between the uk and the us because i think it's very easy one thing i worry about with this stuff and i mean i'm as exercised by it as you are in many ways is how how because it's very easy to get into filter bubbles. It's very easy to kind of nut pick. Oh, look at this, look at this, look at this, and get a kind of a, an understanding of how how kind of widespread it is. I mean, something I thought a couple of years ago when when we first started, and I was kind of making films about this sort of stuff, it felt a little bit more out there. And then increasingly, more and more of my friends who were not kind of came to my friends on the left would come to me and say. I understand this. I've been kind of challenged about this. I kind of like this is. I, I'm realizing this is a problem. Like there seemed to be a cultural shift before the most recent kind of yeah. The, it kind of ramped up to a new level recently, um, and I wonder whether yeah. That's the first question, I guess. Like how widespread is it, and how is it possible that we're being kind of overwhelmed by American stuff that is not as widespread in the UK? I think to the average person in the UK, they're not, they're not as aware of it as America. But I think what happens in America will gradually ripple over here. I just think that's just a fact. And you can see it happening more and more with the effects of this kind of culture, cultural being brought over to our institutions over here. The fact that, you know, it seems to have been largely gripped to the beat by the, you know, the BBC. So to me, what starts in America will always infect us. It may infect us later, but nevertheless, we're going to feel the effects of it. Mm. So I think although it's not as prevalent here, we're just one or two years behind. And the perfect example of that is the BLM. Yeah. And I, I always talk about this with my friends on the left. When they, uh, a lot of them who go out and they, they went uh, and to march for BLM and George Floyd and all the rest of it. And I always go to them, it was a three year anniversary of what? when you were going on your march? They go, what, I don't know. Grenfell. We didn't talk about Grenfell. That has far more power and resonance in this country than the murder of some poor man or killing of some poor man thousands of miles away in Minneapolis. Just for the, say what Grenfell was. So Grenfell uh, was, um, it was, a, it was a tower council estate in West London. Um, which, due to cladding, uh, which has now been proven to be highly flammable, went up in flames. 100, uh, over 100 people died, although that number is contentious. But, uh, and as a result of systematic failings within the fire brigade, within the building, within procedures, and people died, literally burned and, to death. And to do with inequality. And yeah, to do with, to do with inequality, yeah. yeah. And most were people of colour, since yeah. that's now relevant, yeah. Yeah. right? But that's the... That's, uh, was kind of digressing slightly, but that would have seen, I think in the US context, that would have been seen as a like example of racism, pure and simple, where it's like, no, this is much more to do with much more to do with class, much more to do with inequality, much more to do with. But, but the point still stands is that 
this it was movement a uniquely came horrifying over. event. It was a uniquely, it was horrifying, a uniquely horrifying, event. horrifying event, which we're yes. still wrestling with now, which we're still asking questions now. The way we treat people it was related to the housing crisis, how we house people, the people's dignity, the fact that those panels were put up apparently because people, the people in the richer apartment wanted a nicer view. Yet we forgot everything because of the murder of George Floyd and then this import, importing American identity politics. And everyone went out on a march and nobody talked about this issue, yeah. which is still unresolved. And there's another dimension to it, which is the, the death of George Floyd is obviously raising questions uh, about police treatment and police shooting unarmed mm -hmm. black people or people of color. Uh, in the year that it happened in, in 2020, I believe in the United Kingdom, one or two people or maybe the previous year, 2019, one or two people of color who were unarmed were killed by the police in this country, one of whom was Usman Khan, the London Bridge terrorist, right? So this issue doesn't exist in the UK, basically, right? It doesn't exist. British police are not walking around shooting or killing unarmed black people. And yet the, the impact on the culture was huge and the impact on society was huge and people were breaking lockdown, marching when it was completely illegal. And so much as we can say, oh, this is just something Americans get up to, it has a real impact on Britain. And that's why a lot of people feel it. And, and as a consequence of that, we get letters every day uh, from people saying, oh, I just had to do my mandatory uh, unconscious bias training, which we know A, doesn't work and B, makes people more racist. Right. The BBC are now implementing it. It doesn't necessarily make people more racist. It definitely makes them more judgmental of other poorer white groups, I think, is the... I have also remember, I could be wrong, but my recollection is it makes people resentful of minorities. Right. Because they're like, why are you call? Why am I being made to whatever? Uh, may, I could double check me on that. If I'm wrong, obviously, I'll happily take it back. But that was my impression. Uh, and now we have the BBC in this country saying that by the end of next year, 95% of their staff have to have taken this training, which doesn't work. Right. So that thing from America, we can pretend that we're distant from it, but we're not, you know, and which I think is your point, which is the big tech is forcing us all into being American. Yeah. But if that's happening, I think the job of us is to respond to that. Mm. Yeah. And obviously the success of your show shows that there's a desire for that. I mean, obviously in the UK as well as in, as in America. Mm. What's your UK audience? Uh, our UK audience is around 33%, 34% again, depending yeah, on the month. That's, that's higher than ours, I think. Yeah. yeah. Only up to about 20%. Sometimes it's 40. Okay. We have a lot of British focused yeah. guests on too. Yes, because that's what I was going to say. You, you actually have quite a lot of, you yeah. talk a lot more about UK politics maybe than we do as well. Yeah. Quite possibly, um, yeah. yeah. But I, yeah, my, my sort of wrapping up that thought about the UK, and I don't think so many people in the US kind of realize this, that I do think there's a healthier conversation around some of these issues. Mm. Um, you look at the, like the, the trans issue has been like a huge kind of wedge just about everywhere. And what I saw, so recently the Newsnight is up for an award for their set of reports on the Tavistock Centre. Mm -hmm. So a very significant Tavistock Centre was like the centre of a lot of these concerns. And they investigated them and they're up for a Royal Television Society award for their work on that. Mm -hmm. And I sent that to Jesse Single, who's a, a journalist in the US who's mm -hmm. done a lot of tran work on the trans issue and said, that would never have happened in the US. Like it's so third rail. And it seems to me like in most US news organizations in particular, there are certain topics that just mark you out as a bigot if you go anywhere near whatsoever. It does feel like there's a different environment, probably to do with, there's a, there's a lot stronger kind of class-based leftism. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of feminist, um, there's a lot more feminist um, background in lot, the Labour Party in the UK. Mm -hmm. Like those kind of issues I think are, are different. There's a different tone. Um, and also I think we've got a more conservative media like the, the the print media in the UK has always been quite conservative so I wonder about the the danger of only framing things with a like I feel that gravitational pull to the American perspective and I wonder um, I hope that we might have a chance to work through some of these conversations in the UK in a way that they don't in the US I think we've got a deeper culture of kind of civil dialogue um, I think we've got some sense like some 
institutions like the BBC do hold more of a national conversation. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that there's a chance that we can actually work through things in a way that in America it just becomes immediately polarized and just fragmented. Do you, do you have any sense of the difference between those two? I know you're a little bit more skeptical about how <laughs> different we are. Um, I, to me, this, you've mentioned the BBC, and to me that's the crux of this question. It's why I believe the BBC is so important. Because the BBC can be this counterweight, which can bring these two sides together in order to have a discussion, in order that we can share our differences, we can have, and we can have our ideas challenged. I'm really worried that if we defund the BBC and we get rid of it, what's gonna happen is we're just gonna mirror America. That's why I feel the BBC is so, so, so important. However, and I mean, I'm a pessimist by nature, I do think that where America starts, we follow. Yeah, I just want to jump in there because I know that there's a, there's always like, oh, I can't believe you're defending the BBC. I want to jump in there too, by the way. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you used to work for the BBC, you're, you're defending them. Yeah. And what I would say is the BBC is obliged to reflect everyone in the country in a way that no new, news organisation in America is. Mm. And I know that they had this huge kind of um, reckoning after Brexit. They mm. did, like they genuinely kind of were like, how do we miss this? We were not reflecting a whole area of the, of the country. Like they've still got all of the liberal biases that we see and the kind of groupthink of many of the other news organisations, but I do think it's it's it, it is a possible space for that kind of conversation to happen, and I, I I likewise worry about what yeah if it's got rid of we're we're just in a kind of very American situation. So that the t the things that you've both just agreed on is also my hope that the BBC can be that thing. And my grandfather, who, who was arrested by the KGB in the Soviet Union uh, for seeking, for learning English and seeking freedom and criticizing the Soviet Union, the, the biggest uh, crime that he committed in the eyes of the KGB was he had a, a, a radio receptor he used to listen to the BBC World Service, right? So I'm a, a sort of experientially and historically tempted to think the BBC is super valuable. And yes, I also feel, and I'm becoming very woke here because I'm going with my feelings, mm -hmm. that the BBC has the potential to be that, mm -hmm. to be the thing that unites the country. However, I'm not certain that either the people in it, including Tim Davey, the latest, whoever he is, the head of the BBC, and the technology, which we've talked about somewhat, uh, allow, will allow for that to happen. So what I'm seeing and I, again, I hope that you're both right, and that is my, my position. I'm not a defund the BBC kind of person, but what I'm seeing is the BBC's failing on, the, on that. It's failing to deliver the unifying content, the unifying message. And what's worse, they're doubling down on the opposite of that. If you look at their comedy output, it's number one, terrible, and number two, very woke. Right. Uh, and I feel that that is reflected in many, many parts of the BBC. So that's the first part. The second part is technology. Young people don't watch the BBC. Mm. Right. Uh, and young people will determine what happens in the future. Mm. And so technologically, I'm just not certain that taxing people to, to create that is just it's going to be a model that works in the future. So those would be my two concerns. But I do worry. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are like hashtag defund the BBC. And I think that way lies a very bad outcome. I'm just not certain that it can be averted anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say two things. One, one, I'm not solely saying the BBC is the only thing, but I do think that there is British civil society, there feels like there is a place beyond the polarization spiral. Mm. Like there is still kind of a sense of a, of a, of a place like we don't think that the judiciary are completely politicized, which is mm -hmm. what they're coming, they're coming towards very quickly in yes. the US. Mm, yes. But this sense of there are institutions that are outside. Even when COVID happened, you had the Queen come on, come on TV. It's like, oh, there's a, it's like, oh, that's what we've got the Queen for. Mm. Suddenly everyone, like it was a symbol that yeah. most Brits could kind of be like, oh yeah, she makes me feel better yeah. about, mm. about things. Like we're all in it together in some weird way, even though she lives in a palace. But you can't imagine a figure like that in the, in the US. Donald Trump? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He just brings everyone it's together. It's a unifying, yeah. conciliatory yeah. voice. <laughs> Scapegoat is a different kind of way of bringing people together. But yeah, I, so I'm not just saying it's just the BBC, but I do think we have something in the institutions. Even the fact that the NHS exists is like, we can have a unified conversation around the impact on this, like health is kind of a social good mm. in the U UK, which makes the COVID debate different. But just uh, my general feeling is I hope the centre can hold. 
And I don't think the center can hold in the States because of the nature of the kind of, that everything's already fragmented for mostly for financial reasons, because there's no financial reason to, to, to want to attract. Everyone's doubling down on their existing audience, which makes it more polarizing, polarizing which means that you've just got this centrifugal force on their society that I don't think there's any, there's any way of battling. Mm. And hopefully the centre can hold in the UK. That's my that's my general do you, thing. Do you think the reason we might, and I mean, here's a, here's an optimistic note, the reason we might be okay compared to America is we're far more communitarian, whereas in America is far more hyper individualistic. When you consider, you know, the classic example, the American dream, I'm going to go out, I'm going to achieve it. It's me against everyone else, and I'm going to, you know achieve my dreams whilst in Britain we don't have dreams so uh, yeah but no, no, come on that's not, that, no, that's not accurate you want your neighbor to fail that's yeah, the yeah. dream yes yeah, yeah but yeah but, but I do think it, it is a cultural thing as yeah. well yeah. and our institutions are only going to reflect our cultural values as well yeah. but I, I think you're right I think there's also a sort of um, a kind of detachment like yeah. Americans are like very upfront in yeah. the world there's a sort of detachment which is where I think British humor comes from which yeah. is like we it's not that cool to be that kind of invested in stuff. And I think yeah. that that sense of kind of of detachment and humor and sarcasm and irony, I think, is also a protection from mm. like taking yourself too seriously mm. is the ultimate taboo oh, in the UK. Yeah. And that and that I think is one of the, yeah. the key. Yeah, and, we, and I think I agree with that completely, and that's what we try to do. Um, but the other thing we try to do, and this comes back to your point about doubling down on your existing audience, we, we are a podcast in the center, and I think that's part of the answer, doubling down on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's criticize the work left, but let's also not let the right get away with things that they're doing wrong. And let's, let's, let's get more people into that mindset, which is critical thinking, open-mindedness, inquisitiveness, and you know, discussing ideas. Let's do that. I think that's a contribution to, to healing society, not tearing it apart. So uh, it, I think doubling down on your audience can be a bad thing if, if you're sort of in an echo chamber that's extreme. Whereas if you're trying to bring people to the center, I think that's a good thing. Um, and that's, you know, as best we can, we try to do. But there's two things I say to this, one of which I find like the, the best analysis of what's going on is that generally, are you familiar with Jonathan Haidt's work? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah Jonathan Haidt talks about the different moral taste buds mm -hmm. and why good people are divided by politics and religion. Mm -hmm. And he, essentially a lot of what we believe is temperamental. Yeah. And by definition, why do we have, evolutionary speaking, why do we have these different temperaments? It's because we're effective in mixed groups. Yes. Because the answers, the, the situation is changing, the answers change, different people have different things to reflect. But what we've actually done with social media is we've started weaponizing those temperamental differences against each other yep. and then starting to fragment off into different groups based on those temperaments, which if you look at it from that perspective, that's an existential risk. 100%. Because suddenly we're now like, we're destroying the very thing that's got us to this point, mm. which is fascinating. And the thing that we need to survive the future, yes. right? Because driving creative people into an echo chamber of their own and then driving the sort of administrative managerial people into an echo chamber of their own. This is why, you know, uh, much as I'm concerned about cancel culture and people being punished for saying innocuous things or things that even are badly phrased or whatever, uh, you know, Gina Carano, a recent example, uh, the result of that incident is that she's now making movies with Ben Shapiro. Mm. And I just, I just don't, and uh, with all respect to Gina, Ben Shapiro and everybody else, I just don't think what you need is a conservative Hollywood and a woke Hollywood. Yeah. I don't see that as the way forward. I don't think you need woke comedy and anti-woke comedy. I don't think you need woke journalism and anti-woke journalism. I don't think that's the solution here. You know, and while yes, Francis and I yeah, are, because you're preaching to the converted. It's not even that. It's that you you are you are literally splitting society apart. You know, and as as concerned Francis, as Francis and I may be about critical race theory being taught and the idea that kids should be able to pick out their gender at the age of seven and all that sort of thing, the fact that we oppose that does not mean that simultaneously we think everything that's liberal or woke in any way is bad or wrong. We are trying to, I know that it's difficult, but we are actually trying to bring people together. And there's a lot of people on the left who watch the show uh, who recognize some of the critiques we make of the left. And there's a lot of people on the right who watch the show who recognize the critiques of the right. Yeah, I want to pick up on, on that because I think that's a really key point. It's like, I would agree, um, a lot of the framing of rebel wisdom has been talking about kind of a lot of the groupthink on the left and 
the dangers of that groupthink on the left, and it's usually, but it helps to define that, because I, I would say that I, I've always identified as being on the left. Um, Labour supporting parents, I was kind of, I think I tried to sign up for the Labour Party when I was 14 years old. Um, and, but what do you mean when you talk about woke, for example? For me, it's where it hardens into an ideology, it hardens into a sort of way of, um, a, a f that already believes it knows all of the answers to everything and stops inquiring. Like that's where, and it's and it's the dominant force within a lot of the liberal institutions at the moment. Mm -hmm. But I agree, and I'm I'm particularly concerned where I see people getting more and more, kind of what I call um, almost like militantly anti woke or um, anti woke extremist. That then becomes anything that feels like diversity, anything that feels like which I think there's a, there's a place for for, mm -hmm. for cer certainly as long as you bring ideological diversity into it as well, mm -hmm. is really important. There are we do want society to look more like the people who live in it. Like there is, there is a reason for that. Like where it goes too far is, is the interesting point mm -hmm. and the conversa where the conversation gets interesting. And what I like, what I really like, and we've both had her on, Aisha can be, mm -hmm. for me, someone like her, where she talks about wokeness as kind of lacking empathy, like that for me is the kind of a keto move that we need to where you actually, like that's its weak point because it shows that it becomes performative empathy. It's not actually empathetic because it's only one particular perspective. It's not open to all perspectives. And I think that that for me is much more interesting than something like James Lindsay, who just goes to war against the it all all day on, on Twitter. Like I don't think that's gonna win over the people we need to win over. I don't think it's gonna win the argument of the people that we need to win the argument. Um, what do you make of that? I think I don't actually think that the weakness in the movement is the performative em empathy aspect of it, although that is certainly a part of it. I think that the fact that it's incredibly superficial and you can see it through the slavish adher adherence to identity politics, particularly when it comes to the topic of whiteness. For example, what am I? Ask your question. Um, racist. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of... If in that, well, you would be assumed to be uh, an example of, of whiteness. Okay, so yes, uh, my mother's a woman of colour. My, uh, my grandfather was an Arab. They would say that I've never suffered from structural oppression. My family is from Venezuela. My grandfather was murdered when I was 30 years old, a murder that I will never get justice for. My but I think that's part of the lack of empathy. That's no, what I'm saying. Like no, that, no, no, that but no, no. It's not empathetic because it's not seeing you as a person. Yeah, yes, and I agree. But my, my real argument bit is the superficiality. It's looking at me or looking at you and going, oh, I understand everything about who you are because of these superficial things. Because I've decided you are white. It's the yeah. same with me, and Jews have this problem in particular. I remember an experience where I was racially abused by somebody in the street, and that very same day I went home, checked my email about a comedy gig that I was booked for, and the promoter said to me, you know what, uh, we're going to have to reschedule you because we've got too many straight white men on the bill. Meaning that I am, so I've been sort of considered both on the same day. Right. Yeah. And so to me, this is a big part of the problem. But but the, the thing is, you know, you mentioned James Lindsay and, and others. There's different approaches that are needed, in my view. Yes, James has become quite uh, extreme in the way that he approaches it. And it's not the way I would do things. But you do need somebody to articulate the argument about what is actually being taught. You know, and there's th there is I think I, I love Aisha and I think the, what she does is brilliant. I also think someone needs to spell out what is actually being taught in schools and in colleges and in universities. And we just had Jody Shaw, who's just resigned from Smith College, um, on the show. And if you actually look at some of these curricula, curriculums on universities, campuses, they, they are teaching the sort of thing that people would have been taught in Rwanda. That's what they're teaching just with the races reversed or the races flipped or the races changed. And someone needs to say that. Yeah. Someone needs to call it out for what that is too. So, uh, and also the other thing Francis and I both have in common is, you know, he, he talked about Venezuela. I was born in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And some of these ways of thinking that are being introduced are, are setting off a lot of alarm bells yeah. in my head. And we get a lot of people who watch our show who are f em emigrants, emigres from the former Soviet Union and the Baltic countries mm. and other sort of uh, peripheral countries of the former Soviet Union because their alarm bells are going off too, right? So I think while, yes, we, we can talk about the need for Aisha and people like that who can talk to both sides, 
someone also has to go on TV as I've done, you know, with Good Morning Britain and go, no, 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 don't, I don't need you to pretend that I'm English mm -hmm. to make me feel, I'm not English. I didn't, I wasn't born here, didn't grow up here. Uh, my parents aren't English. Finally, you're understanding my argument. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and there's a whole clip of me trying to explain to people who refuse to hear this because they're so obsessed with the idea of diversity. And the other thing I might add as well, and this is probably where we get into my problematic beliefs. I don't believe in artificial diversity at all. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that I should be given a position because I've got slightly darker skin over someone who is more qualified. I don't need that. I don't need that patronizing. I don't think it helps. I don't think there's such a thing as positive discrimination. I think it's bad and I think it creates a bad structure that then influences everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, we can talk about extremes of anti-wokeness. I don't think I'm extremely anti-woke. But there are things about wokeness that trouble me extremely. No. Yeah, I agree with about, uh, what did you call it, performative... Um, yeah. Artificial diversity. Artificial diversity, yeah, yeah for sure. Like, let's take America as an example. Mm. I don't think you can, you can deal with the, the question of black representation in America until you tackle some very deeper issues. Someone like Coleman Hughes. Yeah. Like, if you, if you do, as I think most people would accept, like, there are, there are legacies of entrenched lack of opportunity in some of these some of these cult, some Absolutely. of these communities mm. Mm. that you could date back to to, to slavery. Yes. Mm. You could date back to kind of cycles of, mm. of abuse of like how do you deal with those? Like that becomes a very difficult question. So That's, I don't yeah. I don't think I, I think I'd agree with you and I think there's been evidence that I think Coleman and others have pointed to that um, artificial um, I've forgotten the word was like diversity. Yeah, yeah. No, but they call it, oh, yeah, I, I think there's things that Coleman and others have pointed to about affirmative action in mm. America mm. that it actually has a, 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 a um, negative effect because it often will put, put people um, in, who position are not to fail. in position to fail. Yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a toxic conversation to be had, or that seems to be a very difficult conversation to be had. I think Coleman's the right person to have it. Sure. Um, and, but, if you, what I'm saying is if you're interested in these questions like how do people succeed, how do you make a more equitable society, you're dealing with much more difficult situations than a lot of these conversations go into, which is the only explanation for any of this is white racism that still exists right now. Mm. So I think, I think my point is that we have to have, for me, we have to have these conversations in a more intelligent way. And mm. that there are, there are values and there, are, there is a value to looking at why societies are continually if there are inequalities, where the inequalities are. Mm. But then you also get into questions of like various areas. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, like like, like the, the gender gap at the moment, yeah. there's all of this focus on tech, for example, or areas where women are underrepresented, but there's whole areas now where women are overrepresented that aren't part of the conversation. There's an ideological frame put on this. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's what I think I would say. It's not, sure. it's not about artificially kind of creating. I guess, yeah, and there's so. simply there's some careers that are simply, you know, women will naturally find themselves more attracted to. The classic example of that is a kindergarten teacher. I was a teacher for 12 years. Practically every reception teacher I ever met with an example of one or two were women. And that wasn't because, you know, there's a drive to have more women and whatever else. It's because those women really wanted to be there. They had a maternal aspect to them, which was very strong, and meant they really wanted to do that job. I really loved being a teacher. I never wanted to be a teacher for that level of, for that age of child, because I didn't think my abilities would be suited to it. And part of that was, is the fact that I'm a male. And you will talk to a lot of male teachers who are like, I can't connect with that age of child. Mm. And so for me, the problem is, and it goes back to the superficiality of this whole woke system, is it's simple answers to incredibly complex nuanced problems. Yeah. And there are aspects where you, they talk about, you know, structural inequality, you go, of course I get it. Yeah. Of course, I've worked in schools with kids, the majority of whom are first generation, uh, ethnic minority, whatever else. I've seen the structural inequalities. I know that. I know there's a difference between uh, you know, uh, your local comprehensive in Newham and Eton. There are, there's huge differences, we all know that. But to simply put it down to something as blanket as race, mm. it, it's, it's not gonna solve the problem. It's also not accurate, right? Yeah. The, the evidence yeah. is very clear. That's a good clear. point, like race is often used as a, as a, as a catch-all term, yes. as yeah. if it's the primal factor when it's often other When you factors. break it down, it's actually mm. nothing to do with race, yeah. right? Uh, West African girls, for example, are crushing it. Yeah. Right. How do you oh, explain that? Right. So and Nigerian the, Americans, I think, are the yeah. most successful. Yeah. 100%. So, 
Yeah, so I agree with you that we, we, there's a need for a more intelligent conversation, but there's also another piece to this, which uh, I think is very important for people in the West to understand, and most people don't. And I say this as someone who's an outsider. There is a civilizational element to all of this, which is Western civilization, I feel, has come to a point where, you know, it's a sort of late Roman Empire type of thing. Uh, there is that loss of confidence. There is that are we really as good as we've been told? That sort of thing. And, and, and that's why a lot of these conversations aren't, in my view, starting from the right place. The right place to start this conversation is, yes, we have all these problems in society, but actually we're the most fortunate people in the history of humanity. Let's start at that point. So when we talk about the legacy of racism, when we talk about structural inequality, the starting point, in my view, for that should be, are we better off or worse off than we were 100 years ago, right? Let's start there and let's talk about the progress we've made, right? And what seems to have happened, and I don't have an answer to this, but certainly in America, I remember where I was when Barack Obama was elected because to me, that was a hugely significant moment in human history. And I will never ever be convinced otherwise. That's a thing that I believe fundamentally. The fact that the United States, a country which 200 years had had slavery, just elected a descendant of slaves or a black man or a mixed race man as president, that was a monumental thing. And I remember the overwhelming sense of joy from the vast majority of people at that. There would, have, there would have been people who were, of course, racist, who were frustrated by that, but the vast majority felt that way. What has happened in the 13 years since that happened? That we've, we've become more racist? Really? Really, how did that happen? And you see, I think that's where the big tech conversation really comes in. Uh, I don't think society has become worse, but what has happened is we've been told society has become worse to the point we, we now believe it. And we talk about the idea of privilege, and the reality is that privilege does exist. Some people have different types of privilege, whatever else it may be. I think one of the things that we don't realise, and this is something that has hit home to me because of my background, and I think you understand this as well, is Western privilege. And Western privilege, one, for me, a glowing example of Western privilege is walking down the road with a placard that says, abolish capitalism. When you have, do not have the faintest idea of what that actually means or the implications for that. And you don't know. And to you, it's, you know, waving your placard about and saying you want to abolish capitalism whilst fundamentally misunderstanding what that means and the hellscape that will be unleashed as a result of that. Can you just summarise what if people are watching don't realise what happened in Venezuela? I mean, I do as a journalist. OK, so in Venezuela, uh, Venezuela was... Uh, a um, very wealthy country, biggest, largest oil reserves in the world, fifth biggest oil producer, but a fundamentally racist and deeply unfair society and very, very corrupt, as a lot of Latin American countries are. Um, Chavez came to power in 99 and promised a new and better and fairer society for all. Uh, very, very left wing, championed by you know, the, you know, the Jeremy Corbyn's, etc., etc., saying that he was going to and create this new socialist paradise for everybody. Uh, he came in, first few years, it actually worked, and well, it worked fairly well. And then it became more and more corrupt, he, more authoritarian, seizing the means of production. Then it, the cronyism came in, he got his friends to run the oil companies. Lo and behold, uh, the oil industry collapsed. 97% of our economy was based on oil. That therefore meant that we got plunged into poverty, became more totalitarian, and essentially we're a failed state. So you could go to the shop in Venezuela and you go and buy well, whatever, you know, chewing gum, whatever it is, or a steak or whatever you're trying to find, and they won't have uh, prices on the food. And you ask why, it's because there's no point putting prices on, because due to the fact that we've now hit hyperinflation, the prices at the end of the day will be different from the prices at the beginning. And people are starving now. Yeah, the reason I ask you that is I can feel like the passion that you've got yeah. for this. And is that why you've got the passion for it? Yes, absolutely, background? absolutely. The, you know, it's got the passion for it. I got heavily criticised when the BLM uh, movement happened last summer. Uh, but when I see slogans like, you know, abolish capitalism, defund the police, and people going to me, that's a good idea. I go back to the murder of my grandfather. Um, his his uh, 
a murder will never be investigated, even though we know who the killer is, because uh, Chavez said at one point, I can't remember when it was, but investigating crimes is a sign of right wing oppression. And I, that's when it goes back to what Constantine says, the alarm bells start ringing. And when I hear these, I think, ah, I've seen this before. And also look at look at defund the police, which is the other thing that Francis brings up. Yeah. Look at what's happening in the, in, the, in, the, in the cities in America where they've done that. Black people are being murdered. It's black people that suffer, right? So the consequences of all this sloganeering is that real people get killed, get maimed, get raped. Yeah, we're right? thinking about Minneapolis here, I think, that yeah. has gone through this cycle of defund the police. Yeah. Lots of police officers left. Crime has gone through the roof and now they're having to hire new police officers. Right. And this is the point with this ideology, which is the reason, you know, we can talk about anti-work bias and all that sort of thing. But fundamentally, I've, I've lived in a society which was based on sloganeering, mm -hmm. right? We're going to build socialism with the human face. That's what we were all told, right? It was, it was a world which was based on ideas that didn't have a practical application that worked. And it's the same thing with some of these movements on the work left. These are people who believe in their idea of what they think the reality will look like, but they have no fucking clue what they're actually doing. And they will hurt real people. Mm -hmm. That's why I oppose it. It's not because I, you know, I, I like pissing people off on Twitter, although I do, <laughs> right? But it, it, you know, we've seen the real consequences of this way of thinking. Now, by the way, none of us are saying that all of the left is trying to create Venezuela or the Soviet Union and the West. But some of the modes of thinking are setting off alarm bells. And it's not just us. It's a lot of people. Latin Americans love trigonometry. As I said, immigrants from the former Soviet Union love trigonometry because they recognize these concerns. They, they've seen it before. Yeah. It's not an idea to them. It's a practical thing. And so from our perspective, we're interested in truth. But there's some things that we also know. Right. If I drop this glass, it's going to fall to the floor. I know that that's not a, a pro gravity bias. Right. I know that you know that we all know that. And I think sometimes when we're having these conversations, we have to remember not to buy too much into this mindset, which tells you there's no that's such thing. Maybe as reality. true glass dropping hasn't been tried. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. <laughs> one last question for you. What's one thing we should talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Copycat. Yeah. Um, go for it. The one thing that we're not talking about as a society that we really should be is, I've covered it because I, I don't see it being talked about enough, the effect of lockdown on our children, our children's education, what we're going to do, how we're going to help this generation, because they have suffered and they've been emotionally stunted, physically stunted, educationally stunted by this lockdown. What support are we going to put in place to see that these children, you know, stand the best possible chance. Because if we don't, then we are going to have some very, very, very serious problems that are going to be unleashed on society as a result of it. I agree. Uh, for me, for me uh, I'm, I'm about to uh, get my first book proposal confirmed and I'm, I'm working on a book which will, be, which will be called An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West. Mm. And I think the, there's probably two things within that. The first one I, I sort of alluded to earlier, which is we've forgotten to be grateful for what we have. And I think gratitude on an individual level for what you have is important, but also on the societal level it's important in order to be able to see clearly where you are. Uh, but the other thing, and I've also alluded to it because I do think it's important, is the civilizational element of this. Uh, where is Western civilization and where does it want to go? And I think some of the tectonic shifts that we've seen in the last decade are a symbol of a very bad turn in our view of ourselves. Mm. And if we allow that view to continue to proliferate, uh, history tells us very clearly what's going to happen. Uh, every great empire, every great civilization has followed broadly the same pattern. Mm. Uh, and every, every one of them collapses, uh, not due to exter external defeat, mm. but to in internal strife uh, internal weakness, uh, and uh, I fear that if we are not careful, that is the spiral we're going to uh, go into. And so, for me, this is what the people in the West need need to understand, and I try to get it across as much as I can. Uh, if we don't remember what are the values of Western civilization and why they're valuable, we're fucked. 
the world is absolutely fucked. And I say that as someone who comes from one of the two countries that could potentially replace the West as the leader in the world, Russia and China. If you think the West is racist, try living in a world that's dominated by Russia or try living in a world that's dominated by China. That's when you find out what racism actually looks like, right? And racism is just one aspect of this. Homophobia, misogyny, all of the stuff that progressive people care about, as I care about. They're not gonna get worse when you tear down the founding principles of Western civilization. They're not gonna, they're not gonna get better, sorry. They're gonna get a lot worse. And so the West is the beacon of light in the world. And if you want to tear that down, what comes instead of that is very, very bad. Let's not go there. That to me is the thing that people aren't talking about nearly enough. Since the beginning of Rebel Wisdom, we've been thinking about how to create spaces for people to have new kinds of conversations around big ideas. Which is why we've just launched our digital campfire, which is a central place for people to gather, to find the others, and to make sense together. It's a place to practice the skills we talk about on the channel. So we have regular sessions that help us improve our sense making and also tap into our collective intelligence. And it's all hosted on a discussion platform called Circle, where you can have conversations around our films and articles or on any other topic you're interested in. We've designed it all to be participatory, so you can set up real-time conversations by creating a crew to dive deeper into different topics or practices. So we've got three different levels of membership. Wise Rebel, Explorer, and Sensemaker. All three levels have access to the digital campfire on Circle. And the Explorers also have access to the following official Rebel Wisdom Run sessions. So on Mondays, we have live sensemaking, which is a session where we come together to discuss a hot cultural topic. And then on Tuesdays, we have our Academy sessions, where we have some of the best facilitators in the world teaching various skills. So for example, collective intelligence practice, facilitation training, then on Thursday, we have our Connection Gym. And the sense makers are also invited to our Wednesday sessions, which alternates between Q&A and the Wisdom Gym. The Q&A is with one of the stars of our films and will often go up on the channel itself. And the Wisdom Gym is where we bring in some of the biggest names in transformation and growth to share their practices with us. Within Circle, we've also included a number of resources that we found useful. So sense making tools, meditations, authentic relating games and guides for how to host your own session. So the most important thing to remember is that this is an experimental space and is designed to be participatory. So it's really your space to come in and make your own. So we'd love to see you there.